immutable, unchanging over time or unable to be changed. Through centuries and millennia, through trials by fire and by sword, this word, this gospel has held true. Since the age of the new covenant after the sacrifice of Christ, unchanged, shining as a beacon across a world consumed by darkness, generation after generation must come to understand the gospel as their identity, as their source for justification, and as the truth. No other way, no other news, no other gospel can compensate for scripture. Immutable gospel. Good morning, church. Wow, what a morning. I just, I was literally holding back tears as Grace, I think she's 15 years old, described justification. I mean, how powerful. I'm just so, so thankful to see what God is doing in our midst. So good to be with you. Good to worship. Hey, if you saw Liz Martin on the announcement videos, if you knew how long it took us to convince her to be on announcement videos, so make sure you tell her this week that she did a good job. And Cindy Wagner, I don't know where you're at, but you're next. We're going to get you next. There she is. She says no. Just a few uh, uh, announcements. Just a reminder, tonight at 7 o'clock is our congregational meeting. And again, as Matt described last week, if you would call this your church, if somebody asks you, is Harvest Union count, or where do you go to church, and you would say Harvest, um, we would invite you this evening to come at 7 o'clock just for a meeting. We're going to reflect upon the last four months and, and where we've been, and then uh, give some updates and some vision about the future and where we're heading as a church. Well... This morning, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, so if you want to turn there a while, that's where we're going to be in God's Word this morning, and we're going to be digging into verses 1 through 5. And in these verses, you're going to see the Apostle Paul is asking a series of rhetorical questions. Do you you understand what a rhetorical question is? A rhetorical question is a statement formulated by a, as a question, but it's not actually supposed to be answered. Rhetorical questions are intended to provoke thought rather than to give an answer. So I think as parents, we do this sometimes. I was thinking back this week, one of my beautiful daughters many years ago flushed an entire apple down our toilet. And somehow it made it all the way through the trap and right uh, to the pipe. And when she finally confessed it was her, I asked a rhetorical question. And I I think we do this. I said, now, what were you thinking? You know, I wasn't really, uh, I didn't really want an answer for her. You say things like, now, do you think this was a good idea? No, of course it wasn't a good idea. You flush uh, an apple down the toilet. So I didn't really want an answer to the question. I just wanted her to think about what she had did. So everybody knows what rhetorical questions are. And as we read in Galatians this morning, we're going to see the Apostle Paul asking the church in Galatia a series of rhetorical questions. So let's get right into the scripture. We'll be in Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5. It says this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your word your very word that convicts us. God, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that seals us, that leads us to repentance, that leads us to holiness, 
that sanctifies us. And God, as we study this morning upon your word, God, would you give us clear minds to see what the Apostle Paul was communicating to the Galatian church and how that can apply to our lives today. So God, I'm thankful for this church, thankful for everyone here, God. Would you bless our time together? In Christ's name we pray, amen. So the chapter starts with a bold statement, and then it's followed by the rhetorical question. So Paul starts out and he says, O foolish Galatians. Now the word foolish is pointing out the absolute recklessness of the Galatians. It's not folly in the sense that their decision-making is not intelligent. See, sometimes you can be foolish or have folly because of a lack of knowledge, right? Like we've been in those circumstances where maybe you've seen foolish because you just didn't have information. Well, that is not the case here. The folly Paul is pointing out has to do with the Galatians' disobedience. This was not foolish because of a lack of information. Their decision to be led astray was foolish because they knew better. The Apostle Paul is stunned and angered by their defection of the gospel. And he's making it clear to the Galatian church that he is outraged by this. That's why he says, oh, foolish Galatians. So now he gets to his first rhetorical question. Who has bewitched you? Now, Paul already knew the answer to this question. It was a rhetorical question. It was the Judaizers. The Judaizers were the group of people who claimed to be converted Christians. Their beliefs claimed devotion to Jesus Christ. They were ethnic Jews, but they were not religious Jews. But they opposed the Christian gospel message because they taught that in addition to Christ, they needed to earn their salvation and they needed to do good works to keep their salvation. So Paul uses the term bewitched to describe how they were deceived. If you're bewitched, you've been tricked, you've been deceived, you've been led astray. Bewitched is not an innocent misleading. It's comparing the intentional deception by the Judaizers to pagan magic. That's what he's saying here. The term bewitched is strategic. He's he's, uh, making it seem as if this was pagan magic. And Paul was saying, this is dangerous. Just as you don't play around or dabble with magic you don't play around and dabble with false teaching. He's saying, you've been bewitched. They've appealed to your emotions and they've misled you. The Galatians were deceived by seducing teachers. They were smooth talkers who were experts at convincing people through their words. They were leading people astray. The characteristics of false teachers today are exactly the same as they were in the first century. When the people were led astray, when people were led astray, they're often bewitched by charisma. They're bewitched by personality, forsaking truth to follow people rather than the word of God. And the Apostle Paul is not mincing words here. Oh, foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? But then Paul states, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ publicly portrayed as crucified. So what does that mean? It was before your eyes. Did they they see Jesus crucified? What Paul is saying is the gospel was presented to you so clearly You had such a firm grasp and understanding of what happened on the cross that it was the same as if you had witnessed it yourself. So they did not witness it themselves, but it had been portrayed so clearly and they had such an understanding of the gospel that is, it was as if they were there themselves. The crucifixion was foretold by the prophets and preached boldly by the apostle Paul. 
The Galatians knew Christ's death on the cross provided eternal payment to atone for the sins of all believers. They knew no human works could add to the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. Yet somehow they were deceived by false teachers. They were bewitched by charisma and personality. So that leads us to point number one this morning which is the Holy Spirit is received by faith. And we get this in verse number two. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? You see, this is the Apostle Paul's second rhetorical question. He knew the answer to this question The Galatians knew the answer to the question. The Galatians then and people today receive the Holy Spirit when they're saved. So when do you receive the Holy Spirit? You receive the Holy Spirit when you are saved. They received the Holy Spirit because they heard the gospel and believed by faith. It was not the law that saved them. It was not their works that saved them. They were saved by grace through faith. The Galatians heard the gospel preached by Paul and responded with faith. So Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, receiving the spirit, the Holy Spirit, just, just a point of reference, when you see Spirit, uh, the S capitalized in your Bible, that's referring to the Holy Spirit. Um, the sp- Spirit can be in the Bible, but if the S is not capitalized, it's not referring to the Holy Spirit. Here we're referring to the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is referring to the indwelling and sealing in the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. This is a one-time occurrence. This is the beginning of the Christian life. When you receive the Holy Spirit, that is the beginning of your life as a Christian. The work of the Holy Spirit starts when we come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. So who is the Holy Spirit? First, the Holy Spirit is a personal he, not an impersonal it. I think most people understand and we refer to God the Father as he. We refer to Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, as he. But many times we refer to the Holy Spirit as it, right? Have you heard that? Heard the Holy Spirit we refer to as it? The Holy Spirit is a personal he. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit has all the same attributes as God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit convicts believers of our sin, leading us to repentance. The Holy Spirit inspired Scripture the very Bibles we have today. The infallible word of God was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit renews the minds of believers. The Holy Spirit imparts wisdom to believers, enabling us to understand and discern Scripture. The Holy Spirit provides truth. The Holy Spirit regenerates believers. The Bible says that we as sinners were dead in our trespasses. We were spiritually dead. But the Holy Spirit gives us a new spiritual life. That's regeneration. The Holy Spirit produces spiritual fruit in every believer. So Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such things, there is no law. Believers in Christ who have been saved by grace through faith have the Holy Spirit working within us to produce spiritual fruit. And knowing this, I think we should evaluate ourselves. We should ask ourselves some questions. Am I growing in my ability to love and show kindness to others? If I'm a believer, sealed with the Holy Spirit, I should be growing in that. Do I have more peace and patience in my life? Not perfectly, but am I growing in peace and patience? Do I desire goodness and faithfulness? How about this? Am I more self-controlled than I used to be? These are the marks of a genuine believer. The fruit of the Spirit is not the same thing as spiritual gifts. The fruit of the Spirit are qualities we should all be growing in. The Holy Spirit is received by faith. And those of us who receive the Holy Spirit by faith will have the Holy Spirit working within us. So that brings us to point number two, which is the Holy Spirit sanctifies believers. And that comes from verse number three. And he says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So in verse three, Paul presents the Galatians with a pair of questions. Are you so foolish? And then the question of, are you being perfected by the flesh? And he's clearly already answered the first question here. The very first sentence of chapter three says, oh foolish Galatians. So obviously the question, are you so foolish, has been answered. Yes, they are indeed so foolish. So I don't think we need to spend any more time there. But let's look at the second question. That's where we're going to spend our time. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Paul is frustrated by this idea. The idea that sinful man, fragile man, men who are dependent, fully dependent on God, actually think that they could improve or add to the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's not logical, and Paul wants them to see how reckless it is. Now, last week, Matt outlined in detail the doctrine of justification. So just a a little recap on what justification is. Justification is a legal term. It describes what God declares about the believer. So once you've been saved, you've been justified. It's what God declares about you. To be justified is to be declared as righteous, Justification is an act where he declares a sinful righteous because of the sinner's faith in Jesus Christ. But justification does not change a sinner's nature or character. Okay? So just because you've been saved, that does not change your nature or character. When you're saved, you don't just stop sinning altogether. It's not like once you've been, sin- once you've been saved, All of your sinful desires go away. Justification does not change our sin nature. Because of this, verse 3 is pointing out another very important doctrine. This is sanctification. Paul asks, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Paul was asking, are you being sanctified because of your own will? He's asking, are you growing in the likeness of Christ because of your own doing? Are you growing in holiness because of your own goodness? Are you increasing in righteousness because of your own good works? Paul is pointing out how preposterous this thought process is. 
He's pointing out that the Holy Spirit is the one who grows people in the image and likeness of Christ. The Holy Spirit within us is what sanctifies us. It's what helps us grow in the image and likeness of Christ. This is the doctrine of sanctification. The Holy Spirit sanctifies believers. The book Biblical Doctrine describes sanctification like this. True sanctification is the process of God's transforming work in your life. Sanctification frees you from the pollution of sin, helping you destroy sinful patterns and relinquish your former wickedness. And just as with salvation, sanctification is not accomplished by our will or actions. It's the work of the Lord. It's the work of the Holy Spirit within his people which sanctifies us. Sanctification is ongoing. Justification is a one-time occurrence. But sanctification continues for the believer's entire life. That's why this is called progressive sanctification. So 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in truth. John 17.17. 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. Romans 6, 6. We might know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now listen, being a Christian and sanctification cannot be separated. You cannot be a Christian if you're not being sanctified. The Holy Spirit continually sanctifies believers. Genuine Christians are actively killing off sin. We feed the Spirit and we kill the flesh. Through the sanctification process, we grow in holiness. The Holy Spirit sanctifies believers. But the first step to sanctification is recognizing our sin, right? The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin through what is called conscience. And there's a serious danger in ignoring our conscience when the Holy Spirit is convicting us of sin. So your conscience kicks in, it's convicting you of sin, and there is a real danger if you ignore your conscience. 1 Timothy 4.2, I'm going to read the, the NASB version, which is a little bit different from the ESV version, but it says, by means of hypocrisy of liars seared their own conscience with a branding iron. So Paul Washer describes the searing of conscience this way. When human flesh is cauterized or seared, it loses all feeling or sensitivity. So if, you're, if, if your skin has been branded or seared, that skin, the portion of your skin, no longer has the ability to feel. In a similar but more horrifying fashion, people's conscience can become so cauterized that it loses all sensitivity to evil and is given over to it without shame. So we know how this plays out. This is the idea of a slow fade. So let me give you an example. You can watch a movie that has sex scenes in it and your conscience can convict you that you're watching something that dishonors God. But if you ignore your conscience and you continue night after night to watch movies with sex scenes, at some point you're numb to it. Your conscience isn't convicting you of that sin anymore. 
But where the, where the real danger lies here is, the, is that it's almost always progressive. So now it might move to pornography. Your conscience kicks in again. You know what's wrong. But if you continue in that, sooner or later you're numb to this as well. And it continues down a path that leads further and further into sin. Maybe an affair comes next. You're not even blinking an eye anymore at watching movies that have sex scenes in it. I mean, you are well beyond that. Your conscience isn't even kicking in at all. Even pornography is justified in your head. Your conscience has been seared to that. And Paul's giving us a stark warning. Do not ignore the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctifies believers by convicting us of our sin. If you want to grow in holiness, if you want to grow in righteousness, if you want to be sanctified, then you must yield to the Holy Spirit who convicts us with conscience. The Holy Spirit is who sanctifies believers. Now we're at point number three. The Holy Spirit helps us to endure suffering. Verse number four. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So it's one short little sentence. Paul is turning us to this question. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So what's the context here? Paul is most likely looking back at the persecution the early Christians experienced. They certainly, the persecution in the first century of the first Christians was harsh. And the Galatians certainly would have received some of that persecution. And this is what Paul is addressing. In an earlier visit to the Galatians, we know that Paul had warned the churches that they would suffer persecution. You can read about that in Acts chapter 14. So the persecution Paul warned them about in his first missionary journey did indeed come to fruition. So what Paul is warning them about here is if they turn away from the doctrine of grace if they embrace the heresy of the Judaizers, then all their suffering and persecution that they endured was for nothing, right? They endured suffering. They endured persecution because their eyes was on Christ. Their eyes was on eternity. But if you turn your back now, that was all for nothing. It would have all been in vain. And I think this is a concept that we can understand, we are willing to suffer short-term for a long-term gain. So students, I see some students in here. You suffer through hours of study in hopes of getting a good grade, right? Studying's not fun. You suffer through it, but your eye is on a good grade, right? You put in the short-term work for the long-term gain. But if you send hours and hours studying... And then your foolish friend convinces you to let him cheat off of you. And then you get caught and you fail. Your suffering was for nothing. You put in the hard work and it was all for nothing. What Paul was just pointing out, you've suffered for Christ and now you're being deceived? This is what he's saying. You suffer persecution and now you're compromising. This makes no sense. Paul is telling the Galatians, you need to endure. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us endure. The Holy Spirit who lives within us is the one who helps us endure. Romans 5, 3 through 5. More than that, we, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
As Christians, we must rejoice despite our circumstances. In the midst of trials, in the midst of suffering, our call is to be joyful. And it's not joyful because the trials are fun. But because these trials produce transformation in our lives. Trials produce transformation in our lives. This transformation conforms us more and more into the image of Christ. And Romans 5 shows us this process. Suffering produces what? Endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. That's the process. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. That hope is Jesus Christ. Our hope is that the Holy Spirit lives within us, guaranteeing our final salvation. We have nothing to fear. Christians should not live in fear of judgment day. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There is great hope in this. We belong to God. We are children of God. We've received God's love because the Holy Spirit poured his love into us when we were saved. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us endure suffering. Our last point, point number four, comes from verse number five. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do good works. Verse number five says, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So here we see Paul's final rhetorical question. And it's a repeat of an earlier question. Again, it's the same question. Does God supply the Holy Spirit to you by works of the law or by faith? The question is a reminder. You were saved by hearing with faith. They did not receive the Holy Spirit through works of the law, but through God's message of Christ crucified. Faith is not, the on, is not only how we begin the Christian life, but it's also how we live as Christians. We live by faith. Paul is pointing out the enduring work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the Galatians. Paul was the one who planted the churches, and then he left the region. But in his absence, genuine believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit empowered the Galatians to do good works. As people of faith who were sealed by the Holy Spirit, they were empowered for good works. The Holy Spirit was working within believers before the Judaizers even showed up with their false teaching. So how does it make any sense that abiding in the Judaizers' false doctrine is what was enabling the Holy Spirit? Are you following me there? Before the Judaizers even showed up, the Holy Spirit was within them, prompting them to good works. So how does it make any sense for them to believe that it was when the Judaizers showed up to give them a set of rules that was doing the work? It was not. The Holy Spirit was doing the work. It was empowering them to do good work before the Judaizers even showed up. It is the Holy Spirit within us that empowers us to do good works. As believers, we must not limit the power of the Holy Spirit by quenching the Spirit. The idea of quenching the Spirit is one of the most misunderstood verses in Scripture. Quenching the Spirit does not mean limiting the Holy Spirit's ability to work because you're thoroughly prepared. So there are some people who would say that by coming up here with a bunch of notes where we've studied and we prepared, you're quenching the Spirit. You're not giving the Spirit any, any room to work. That somehow, 
hours of studying is limiting the Holy Spirit's ability to work, as if the Holy Spirit wasn't working and leading in the preparation. This is not what quenching the Spirit means. And this thinking is fairly widespread in the American church, and it's just blatantly not true. So what is quenching the Spirit? We see the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 talking about quenching the Spirit. Quenching the Spirit is indeed limiting the Holy Spirit's power to do good works within believers. So it is indeed limiting the Holy Spirit's power to do good works within believers. In God's Word, He often uses word pictures to describe the Holy Spirit. One of the word pictures He uses to describe the Holy Spirit is fire. Have you heard this? Like the Holy Spirit. God uses a word picture to describe the Holy Spirit, and it's fire. God uses fire as a visual representation of the Holy Spirit. The quenching of the Holy Spirit is referring to dousing out the fire. It's like putting a wet blanket on the fire. So how do we do this? We subdue the Holy Spirit. We quench the Holy Spirit with our sin. We quench the Spirit when we live in sin. The way to limit the power of the Holy Spirit is to live in unrepentant sin. This is what the verse is saying. The Holy Spirit empowers to do good works, but the power of the Spirit can be, dis- can be subdued if you're drenching the fire of the Holy Spirit with the sin in your life. As Christians, we must not quench the Spirit. We must live lives that are above reproach so that we no way limit the power of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to do good works. Now, the Galatians have been bewitched by false teachers and have begun to believe that they could add to Christ's work on the cross by their good works. And I know there's a fear sometimes. Do you fear that you will be deceived? God's word says that we'll be able to recognize false teachers by their fruits. So Matthew 7, 15 through 17 says, beware of false prophets when they come to you like sheep's clothing, but inwardly and ravish and ravish wolves, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. The warning here helps us to understand that false teachers may appear to be authentic. They will come in sheep's clothing. They will look and sound like the real thing. But when we examine them a bit more closely, we can identify them by their fruits. His word says, a healthy tree bears good fruit. A diseased tree bears bad fruit. Do do these people deny Christ by their speech? Do these people deny Christ by their lifestyle? Do they say one thing and do another? Do they model Christ in their actions with others? In their humility and love, do they have a genuine care for others? If you fear being deceived, my recommendation is that you read the Word of God, the Word of truth. Hold everything up to it and reject teaching from those who deny it, either in their words or in their actions. And have no fear because we as believers have the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your word, your word of truth that we can go to to study who you are 
God, I am so grateful for God, the Holy Spirit, who lives within us, who convicts us of sin, who leads us to repentance, who empowers us to live lives that glorify you. God, would this church be a body of believers who aims to bring glory to you in everything we do, how we speak, how we act. God, would we glorify you? Will we turn people to the gospel truth that our sin deserves eternal punishment, but Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and now he sits at the right hand interceding on behalf of believers. God, we are so grateful. Lord, I'm thankful for this church, thankful for this body of believers. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus.